Well, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Carolyn Winterer, the director of the Stanford Humanities Center, and it's just wonderful to have you here today for this class without a quiz uh, in, on uh, Freedom Now, the Civil Rights Movement in American History and Memory. You are sitting right now in the epicenter of the humanities on campus, and we're so delighted that this alumni event can happen here reminding us all of the ways that the humanities touch our lives, both during college and after. The Humanities Center is celebrating its 36th year this year, and we moved into this building, the former Bowman Alumni House, in 2001. So if you graduated before then, you knew this as the Alumni House. Afterward, you knew Ariaga as the Alumni House. This is the perfect space for carrying out our important mission of promoting the humanities both inside and outside the university. Each year, the Humanities Center helps to stage about 50 events for the Stanford community and the general public. We also have approximately 30 scholars in residence at all stages of their careers, including undergraduates, graduate students, Stanford faculty, and visiting faculty from around the world. It's such a very great pleasure to have Professor Jim Campbell as our speaker today. He was a fellow at the Humanities Center in 2012-13, and so has experienced firsthand how the center functions as a hub and facilitator of humanities research. And we are just delighted to be hosting his presentation today. I should say that we are also very, very close colleagues, both working in the same time period in the history department. So I assure you, you are in good hands. Immediately following the class, there will not be a quiz. Rather, there will be something much more pleasant, we hope, which is a small reception in the lobby right out here from 4.30 to 5.15, and we very much hope you can stay and partake and continue the conversation with Professor Campbell. Along with other members of the center staff, I will be on hand to answer any questions you may have about the center. I feel like I'm suddenly bathed in heavenly light here. Um, so something good must be about to happen. There are brochures and bookmarks for you on the lobby out there, and also sign-up sheets where you can put your name if you would like to uh, be added to our mailing list. And last, but certainly not least, there are copies of Professor Campbell's books for you to look at, to inspire you to go to the bookstore to buy them. So now let me uh, hand you over to Christy Geller, who will introduce Professor Campbell. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to class. I'm Christy Geller, and I work at the Stanford Alumni Association and the Travel Study Department. Um, before I introduce the professor, I would ask that you take this time to check your cell phones, make sure that they're turned off. I also wanted to let you know that we are recording this class. And so please hold your questions to the end, the question section, because I'll be bringing around a microphone. We wanna capture your questions. So if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll be trotting around with a microphone. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Jim Campbell has his master's and PhD from Stanford, um, master's in 83, PhD in 89, and he's the Edgar E. Robinson Professor in United States History. He researches African-American history and the wider history of the Black Atlantic. His research spans the history of the American slave trade with Africa, the Harlem Renaissance, and the Civil Rights Movement. Jim's experience has led him to become a historical consultant for many different organizations, including the History Channel and a documentary film series entitled This Far by Faith, African-American Spiritual Journeys. His 2000 six book, Middle Passage, African American Journey to Africa, 1787 to 2005, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in History. Jim has served as a resident fellow and is currently Stanford's director of residential programs. Please join me in welcoming Professor Campbell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I shouldn't say this. The modern uh, version of performance anxiety is that your technology is going to fail. And uh, there's a little bit of a bait and switch. Um, the talk I was um, going to give you until about 45 minutes ago, 
which is a talk that I kind of trot out for occasions like this, I decided not to do. Uh, I decided what I would wanted to share with you was uh, a book that I'm hoping will be out, it's just finishing now, and I'm hoping will be out um, next year. And it's actually something that I've never previously spoken about in a public venue. It relates to the theme, quite as you'll see, quite directly. Uh, and it's a book that is in a kind of long essay accompanied by a set of photographs about a woman, by a woman about whom I'm going to be speaking. Uh, and because these are extraordinary high resolution photos, they just kept collapsing the PowerPoint system. So I finally dragged them just onto the screen. And they were until I plugged in the HDMI cable showing as full size. And now I'm in a loop and I'm in a terror that this is going to all disappear. In which case, I will be reduced to shadow puppets. But um, let's see how far we get. Welcome to Philadelphia, Mississippi. Um, I'm sure I've looked, I've been looking at the dates on some of your alumni badges that that word rings some bells with some of you. Uh, as people in Philadelphia, Mississippi will be the first to tell you, it is a city that lives under a kind of cloud. The capital of Neshoba County, Mississippi, it is also the site of the most notorious crime of the civil rights era, the murder of three civil rights workers James Cheney, Michael Schwerner, and Andrew Goodman by a Ku Klux Klan mob, including the local sheriff and deputy sheriff on June 21st, 1964. Uh, that murder has become, in some sense, one of the iconic moments in American history, rehearsed in scores of books, thousands, literally, of newspaper and magazine articles, plays, paintings, including one by Norman Rockwell, folk songs, television documentaries, and no fewer than three Hollywood movies. Given the sheer number of people who were murdered and assaulted in Mississippi during the death throes of Jim Crow, it's rather striking that we all know these people's deaths. We do not know the circumstance of the death of George Lee or Herbert Lee or Lewis Allen or Warless Jackson. The list could go on and on. One of the reasons why this case has commanded our attention and why it commanded the attention of the nation for the 44 days in which the men's bodies were sought before they were finally uncovered in an earthen dam outside Philadelphia was obviously the fact that two of the victims were white. But the case also owes its notoriety to the conduct of local townsfolk who contrived to live down to every northern stereotype of southern recalcitrance and bigotry. Egged on by local and state leaders, white Neshobans dismissed the disappearance as a hoax perpetrated by the men themselves to discredit Mississippi and pave the way for a federal invasion of the state. Journalists covering the case were assaulted and shot at. A cameraman for NBC had his car deliberately rammed inside of a policeman who then wrote him a ticket for reckless driving. Locals lined bridges to heckle searchers, dragging streams and swamps below. Investigators met stony silence. The FBI lead investigator, a man named Joe Sullivan, later remarked, Neshoba County did not need a Klan. They were the most conspiratorial group of people I ever met. They were just naturals. Even after the FBI broke the case, arresting 19 local men on federal conspiracy charges, local whites remained defiant. Many continued to claim that the victims had been murdered by their own civil rights colleagues to win sympathy for the movement. According to one ubiquitous rumor, the dirt on the recovered bodies did not match the dirt where they were buried, confirming that they had been killed elsewhere. And just a little footnote in the realm of atrocity, that's a ubiquitous rumor also among uh, Bosnian Serbs in regard to the mass graves at Srebrenica. The idea being there that the international forces moved people murdered or killed in the tsunami in Indonesia and quickly buried them at Srebrenica in order to discredit Serbia. Others acknowledged what had happened but insisted that the three young men had come to Neshoba County, quote, looking for trouble and, quote, got what they deserved. With the filing of federal charges, the entire Neshoba County bar enlisted in the defense team which was supported by a community fundraising campaign complete with donation charges, jars in local banks and businesses. 
Even as the case dragged through dismissals and reindictments, it would ultimately take a U.S. Supreme Court decision for the prosecution to proceed. The accused men swaggered around town. Deputy, Price, Deputy Sheriff Cecil Price, who would eventually serve six years in prison for his role in the killings, cited his experiences in 1964 as a qualification in his 1967 campaign for sheriff. Quote, I think my actions in the past prove that I want our way of life upheld whenever it is attacked by outsiders who have no real interest here except to stir up trouble, he announced in declaring his candidacy. He ran a strong third in the dozen candidate race, which was won by another of the murderers, Hop Barnett, who was spared prison by a hung jury. In this atmosphere of furious conformity, only a tiny handful of white townspeople spoke out braving social ostracism and threats of violence to denounce the murders and decry the climate of fear and intimidation that had overtaken their hometown. And I do not wish in emphasizing the small number of white townspeople to deny or dismiss the much extraordinary, much greater, much more pervasive and much more astonishing courage exhibited by members of the local black community. Few white people did so as openly and courageously, and here we see a whole thing collapses. Um, I'm just going to have to pull these over. As Florence Mars. Florence Mars confronted community leaders, vainly urging them to speak out against the murders. She cooperated with FBI agents investigating the case and testified to a federal grand jury investigating local authorities' brutal treatment of black citizens. She spearheaded a Philadelphia to Philadelphia project, a youth exchange with the town's Pennsylvania namesake, which was reeling from its own racial upheavals in 1964, and launched a local fundraising campaign to rebuild Mount Zion Church, a local church that had been burned by the Klan, in direct opposition to the defense fund being raised on behalf of the murderers. Offered a simple choice, in her words, between church builders and church burners, she believed that the decent folk of Philadelphia might finally stand up and condemn the murders. In her book, Witness in Philadelphia, one of the classic memoirs of the civil rights era, she recounted the reactions her conduct provoked, police surveillance, obscene phone calls, death threats, shunning by friends and neighbors. Rumors swirled that she was on the payroll of the FBI. A Klan organized boycott forced her to sell her business. She became such a thorn in the side of Sheriff Lawrence Rainey, one of the murderers, that he tossed her in the drunk tank, an act that actually scandalized some townspeople more than the murders themselves. The campaign to rebuild Mount Zion collapsed after prospective donors demanded assurance that the new building would never be used for civil rights activities, a condition the church members refused. Most painfully, Mars was forced to resign from her positions as youth, uh, as teacher of a women's class and youth group convener in Philadelphia's first Methodist church after protests from her congregants who feared contamination from her dangerous beliefs. Now, Florence Mars was ob obviously a singular woman, but her experience raises universal questions, the questions that humans always ask in the aftermath of atrocity. How do we explain the events of 1964? Not only the murders themselves, but also a community's retreat into furious denial. How do ordinary people become complicit in grave injustice? And how, in such fevered circumstances, do a few people find the courage to resist, to recognize evil and call it by its name? Mars herself often pondered these questions. Lots of us have discussed that, she told one interviewer. The people who grew up here grew up under certain pressures, any group of people. Why is it that some people seem to be able to get out and see? Well, I'm going to jump forward here. I'm not going to read you the whole book. Um, I've spent, uh, I decided some time ago for reasons completely unrelated to any work that I was doing, uh, and still is mostly unrelated to the work that I'm doing, but I decided I got interested in going to Philadelphia, Mississippi. And I just wanted, wondered what it was to live in a town that lived in the shadow. And I started to go 16 years ago and to collect stories. And I have now gone to Mississippi over those last 16 years, something between 70 and 80 times. Uh, I've conducted literally thousands of conversations with 
civil rights activists, people from different walks of life in the community, attended funerals, memorial services, commemorations, trying to actually see, think about what stories find their way into our historical memories and what stories are forgotten. In the course of doing that, I got to spend some time with Florence Mars. And I asked her the same question. How could you see what others couldn't see? And she told me two answers. One was her family, and one was the fact that she was a photographer. Let me tell you briefly about her life and her family, which is a sort of saga straight from Faulkner. Tell you a little bit about her movement into photography. And then I just want to show you some of these photographs. Though its Neshoba County roots ran deep, the Mars clan was always a contrarian lot, conscious of its difference, and these are all quotations, from the great unwashed crowd. We were the Satorises of Neshoba County, Mars explained, indulging the inevitable Faulkner reference. Family members went to college. They read books and had the habit of conversation. They argued over dinner and were never afraid to ask questions, even if it meant challenging small town verities. In Witness in Philadelphia, Mars recounted a childhood trip to the 1934 World's Fair in Chicago where she saw dinosaur bones, bones whose age belied her Sunday school teachers claim that the earth was only 4,000 years old. Returning to Philadelphia, she challenged him. It's just better not to go into things like that, he replied, an answer that she found silly even as a child. Such a household bred more than its share of eccentrics and of tragedy. Adam Mars, Florence's father, was a gentle, soft-spoken man with a beautiful tenor voice and addictions to alcohol and morphine, the latter acquired in the 1920s when opiates were frequently prescribed as a hangover cure. He attended the University of Mississippi, where he counted among his friends a young William Faulkner and dreamed of a career in music, was pressured, however, by his father into studying law which he practiced desultorily until his death from alcohol poisoning a few days after his daughter's 11th birthday. Adam's younger brother, William Fenton, was also an alcoholic and morphine addict, as well as a genius with a near photographic memory. William, and again these are quotations, never worked a day in his life, but he was a familiar figure in the town, strolling the streets reciting Shakespeare, the Latin Mass, and the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, all from memory. Another younger brother, James, committed suicide shortly after returning from service in World War II. Florence's mother, Emily Geneva, known as Neva, was more conventional, at least by comparison, but her older sister was anything but. Red-haired and flamboyant, a dead ringer for Ethel Barrymore, one townsman told me, and just as histrionic. She bobbed her hair, smoked, listened to jazz records, and moved to New Orleans where she ran off with a Swedish ship's captain. Returning later to Philadelphia, Ellen would join her niece as an outspoken opponent of the Klan. The paterfamilias of the Mars Klan and the formative influence on young Florence was W.H. Doc Mars. Got a picture of Doc Mars as a young man, I believe, with Adam, her father. A large, loquacious man who was also the largest landowner in Neshoba County. Born two years after the end of the Civil War, he earned a medical degree at Vanderbilt, but practiced only briefly, devoting his energies instead to Mars Brothers, a country store that he opened with his younger brother in 1891. Mars Brothers sold everything from pork rinds to penny nails, but its main business was furnishing farmers, supplying struggling landowners and tenants with rations, cotton seed, mules for plowing, and whatever else they needed to pull a crop from the ground, all at 8% per annum. When the inevitable defaults happened, the good doctor was not shy to foreclose, a practice that enabled him to accumulate more than 17,000 acres of Neshoba County land. By Florence Mars' own account, Doc Mars had insisted on presiding over her birth and botched it, leaving her with a host of physical ailments, including blurred vision in one eye and a foreshortened left leg. But she, more, she bore him no grudge. On the contrary, she adored her papa. They spent endless to days together growing up, traversing the, day, the county's clay and corduroy roads in their large sedan, visiting tenants, collecting debts. Always inquisitive, she barraged him with questions, but rarely got straight answers, receiving instead long disquisitions about local history and the origins of different families. 
As a child, she found this penchant for roundabout answers frustrating. But in time, she realized that the context was the answer. I grew to understand what Papa thought, that an answer can't be understood without knowing the background. This habit can be tiresome, especially when you're in a hurry. But neither one of us was. Though they rarely discussed racial questions directly, Mars clearly inherited some of her heterodox views from her grandfather. It was he who first called her attention to the large number of fair-skinned black families in the county, an astounding revelation for a child. He once showed her a tree where a black man had been lynched and joined her in supporting Harry Truman in the election of 1848, even as 95% of voters in Neshoba County flocked to the banner of Strom Thurmond's Dixiecrats. What is this business with the Negro, Florence once asked him after witnessing some racist affront. I'll always remember the way he answered, she later wrote. He leaned forward, placed both elbows on his knees with his hands clasped together and said, they've been treated mighty bad. I go on so to talk a little bit more about the influence, but let me now jump to Florence Mars in college where some of the seeds sprouted in her youth would continue to grow. She went first to Millsaps, a Methodist liberal arts college in Jackson, where she wrote a column on jazz for the student newspaper and made a lifelong friend in Betty Bobo, a similarly iconoclastic daughter of a Delta planter, who, by the way, is still alive and just lives up the road. God bless her. She then proceeded with Betty to the University of Mississippi, where in their first year they became involved according to which of their accounts you believe, actually fomented a strike by black laundry workers. Though she always returned to Philadelphia, she traveled widely during the uh, war years and then in the years after the war, further broadness, broadening her horizons. She worked during the war for Delta Airlines in Atlanta. After the war, she traveled to New York City where she visited jazz clubs like the Royal Roost, listening to Charlie Parker, Thelonious Monk, Billy Eckstein, and the other progenitors of bebop. She attended a Billie Holiday concert and bought a recording of Strange Fruit, Holiday's searing indictment of Southern lynching. That recording in turn led her to Lillian Smith's novel of the same title, as well as to Smith's Killers of the Dream, a semi-autobiographical exploration of the psychic and spiritual damage that segregation had wrought in Southern whites. A small town woman who defied the racial and sexual norms of her natal region, Smith became an important model for Mars, though they apparently never met. Years afterward, Mars would keep on her desk a passage from Killers of the Dream, quote, I wrote it because I had to find out what life in a segregated culture had done to me one person. I had to put down on paper those experiences so that they could have meaning for me and I could see it. I was in dialogue with myself as I wrote, with my hometown and childhood and history, as well as the future and the past. Mars spent most of the 1950s living in New Orleans, just 200 miles away from Philadelphia, but a universe away culturally. She entered psychotherapy in New Orleans, continuing off and on for a decade. She frequented local jazz clubs and found her way into the white bohemian community around The Outsider, a literary journal featuring the work of beat writers like Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg. Seeking a creative outlet of her own, she took up painting and later photography under the mentorship of a famous American artist Oh, that, by the way, that's in the Shoba County Square in the 1920s, and that's something. I'm sorry, with this, we're not seeing these photos uh, with a better background. I apologize. With Ralston Crawford. Crawford, in addition to being uh, a leader of the independents, a group of American modernists known for their stark geometrical paintings of industrial landscapes, was also an accomplished photographer, and he encouraged Mars' dawning interest in the medium. They spent countless days together in New Orleans photographing street scenes and jazz clubs. If you've seen a pictures of, jazz, of Preservation Hall in its early days, it was almost certainly taken by one of the two of them. They also undertook photographic excursions to Mississippi 
including one expedition to find and photograph the last traveling blackface minstrel show in the United States. And that's what they're doing here. In Witness in Philadelphia, Mars would portray her turn to photography as a more or less spontaneous response to the political turmoil engulfing Mississippi in the 1950s. As she told me, after the Brown v. Board decision, she realized that Mississippians were losing their minds, that the world she had grown in, up in was going to disappear. In fact, it seems to me that the decision to create a photographic record of her world was part of a long personal journey a decades-long quest to make sense of the place in which she had grown up and of her own conflicted relationship to it. How do some people learn to see? Part of the answer in the case of Florence Mars was through the lens of a camera. Thus, in 1953, she purchased a Graflex 22, an inexpensive knob-wound camera with a top viewfinder, and began to take pictures. She took them for the next 11 years essentially creating thousands of images of ordinary black and white life in the county that would, in 1964, become the epicenter of the violence and the horror of Jim Crow's death rows. She told me about this. Um, nobody had ever seen the photos. She never sold them. She took them, took them incessantly built a homemade dark room in an upstairs hall of her house, and printed films late into the night over and over, creating a record for herself. Um, she's passed now, but uh, the book I'm bringing out is a book of her photographs. And I'm just now going to spend the rest of the time showing you some of these images. Uh, I didn't know what to expect when I w started into these things, but it turned out that she was, I think, one of the really great Photograph, photographers that 20th century America has ever produced. She began locally, simply taking images that were familiar to her from growing up, images of local street scenes, shoppers on a Saturday in the town square, blacks on the street, whites on the sidewalk. A poor white family in town on a Saturday, shopping. A white man gliding past a Choctaw family. Neshoba County is and is the headquarters of the Mississippi band of the Choctaw Nation. And some of the most compelling photos that Mars took are not just of black and white people, but of Choctaws. Children playing on the Confederate Memorial in the Neshoba County Fair, of the Neshoba County Courthouse. Yeah, it's a photo of such intimacy. I'm sorry to go through, I mean, some of these we should dilate. If you want me to slow down on one, just I'm happy to do it. This way you'll have to buy the book. Passerby, watch, passerby as watching the refuse of a bootlegging raid being destroyed on the courthouse lawn. Neshoba County was the wettest dry county in all of Mississippi. In fact, this is a, actually crucial to understanding the, the sequence of the murders and the involvement in local law enforcement. Until the 1980s, do you know what the salary of a sheriff in Mississippi was? Zero. Do you know what his budget was for things like cars, hiring a deputy, zero. These jobs were jobs that you took and you made from them what you could make of them. You got a portion of fines and you also got immense kickbacks from local bootleggers. So what you have in these places are essentially criminal syndicates that own local law enforcement which in the case of Mississippi in 1964 will also become part of the Ku Klux Klan. Many of the photos, the early photos that Mars took in 53 and 54 were at a local fish fry. On Saturdays, black and white farmers alike would come into town to buy supplies. This woman, a woman named Roxy Kirkland, would come to town with an old cast iron wash pot in which she would set up in a vacant lot 
and fry fish, then selling fried fish sandwiches with ketchup. As the afternoon went on, black people, done with their shopping, would come and would sit in the shade of a narrow tarp. And Mars began to go there, she knew most of them, and take photos, and then return the following Saturday with prints of the photos and taking more. So I'll show you a few of the fish fry photos. That's Roxy Kirkland herself. That's an extraordinary photo, isn't it? I love these, these next couple together, and you'll see why. There's only a few of these. You see him coming, her coming back, with people having prints of themselves. You know, this is actually, you know, one of the things, we're all familiar with the Farm Security Administration photos that are taken in the 30s by Dorothea Lange and Walker Evans and others. And scholars today, there's an enormous debate about the ethics of what they were doing. And one of the that's very interesting about her. She never sold a photo for money, as near as I can tell. And she routinely would return and share prints of the people she was taking photos of. Which isn't to say that there aren't ethical complexities in this process. What freedom did a black person in Jim Crow, Mississippi have when a white person said, I'd like to take your photo? We don't know what the nature of the transaction between she and the people who she was photographing might have been, what words transpired, what was in the hearts of those people who submitted to photos. And yet, and believe me, I've looked at these photos. With a couple of exceptions, it's very hard to look at any of them and um, see these as in some sense, or imagine these as in some sense extorted. It is possible that what they reveal is nothing more than the studied impassivity with which black people living in a racist, violent Jim Crow world had learned to deal with a white world. But it's also hard to believe for me that that's all it is. And as you'll see in many of these photos, people look straight through the image and the, the lens of the camera, fastening our eyes with extraordinary frankness. I know that, that child, um, she's older than me. This is my favorite one from the fish fry. This is a local school teacher. He's carrying a half dozen copies of the Chicago Defender a newspaper that had begun to circulate during the age of the Great Migration, often in secret, brought down to Chicago along the Illinois Central Railroad by Pullman porters, and distributed throughout Mississippi and the Delta region through what have long been largely invisible circuits of distribution, but now we know at least one of those circuits, don't we? It's lots going on in this photo. The headline promises a report on the Trumbull Park riots in Chicago in 1953. Violent series of riots provoked when housing administration officials inadvertently or unwittingly had given access to a previously all white uh, housing project to a light skinned black family, provoking riots and bombings and burnings. There's a lot going on in this photo. It suggests to us that black people never were the, si the simple pre-political folk imagined by whites. It reminds us that race is not so simple a thing. It reminds us that violent opposition to integration was never a southern monopoly. I 
I love this photo. And it's interesting to me, too, because it's one of the few photos. She often wrote down the names of the people who were in the photos. In this case, she didn't. But I think I have a reference to this photo in correspondence with one of her friends, Turner Catledge, which is actually interesting because Turner Catledge was the editor of the New York Times. One of the things you can't quite imagine, again, I said this to my class this morning in a different context, that one of the advantages of being a historian over being a historical novelist is that we can have stuff in our books that really happened that nobody would believe if it were fiction. <laughs> so the editor of the New York Times in 1964, dealing with reporting on this trauma of the murder of two white New York City kids in the small town of Philadelphia, Mississippi, was himself from Philadelphia, Mississippi. And the reference in this photo, I think, it's a photo of the town drunk, a man called Old Steamboat. And Turner Catledge makes a kind of what to our mind is quite unsettling comment about, I wish Old Steamboat had a nickel for every time he'd been locked up, or words to that effect. But the image to us, I don't know what, it suggests something rather different, doesn't it? This is an image from a church picnic. And she would spend hours, and we fortunately, she kept all of her negatives. So we were able to create very high resolution TIFFs off the original negatives. But we have a lot of her prints, and she would spend, excuse me, she would spend hours on her prints, printing images over and over, catching and dodging, trying to bring out the planes of a face or the strength of a pair of hands. Sorry, maybe I don't. Got it. Again, these are very different images from what we imagine or what we had, would have imagined the meaning of a place like Neshoba County in 1964 was. That's a troublesome photo, isn't it? had an argument with one of the people who I've been showing this who didn't want me to use this photo, in part because it lends itself to various kinds of dismally familiar narratives about white children and their mammies and the help and so forth. But it's a photo. It's a reality. And it's a beautiful image. That's a photo for you. Interestingly enough, there's a bunch on the contact sheet of these. She spent a long time with these guys taking these images. These do not strike me. And it's also in the next town over, so they wouldn't have known her. This isn't Kosciuszko. Uh, this doesn't seem to me to suggest people who have no option but to submit to being photographed. see her in the upper right reflected, taking the image. You don't know if you've ever seen the book Richard Wright's 12 Million Black Voices, which is a beautiful essay that Wright published, I think, 1941 accompanied by a series of the Farm Security Administration photos, both of rural Mississippi and of uh, World War II era Chicago. Uh, and one of the lines in that book is, we are not what we seem. And I keep hearkening to that as I look at these photos. This is a woman named Gertrude who became one of Mars's most important interlocutors. I'm going to read to you just for a moment again. Um, Gertrude was uh, 
Mars's domestic worker. Sorry, I should have had this ready. Yeah, I'll, I can just tell the story. This particular print, Gertrude was illiterate. This particular print, actually, she, Mars had penciled in back. I cannot read, but I can understand. Gertrude was an extraordinarily wise woman, and through her, Mars was able to gain access to sites that m white photographers normally wouldn't. A rural black church, a church picnic, black people rendering hogs or pressing cane involved in ordinary quotidian activities that whites not, would normally not have seen. Uh, Mars recounts in one of her writings asking Gertrude, when did she first realize that by virtue of being black, her life would be different? And Gertrude told her a story of being an itty bitty girl holding her aunt's hand and listening to the cries of people inside a house being burned as whites with shotguns ringed the house to prevent anyone from escaping or anyone from rendering assistance. Gertrude had a way of putting flesh on the bone, Mars wrote. Here's a photo for you. That's a straight Walker Evans photo, isn't it, right? And yet the next one immediately after it on the contact sheet is anything but. That's a photo, could be any time within a century. A cotton sack, almost like a bridal dress with a train. That's one of my very favorites, actually. There are dozens of prints enlarged trying to capture that woman's hands. A churchman exhorting his congregation. Here's one where you have a woman who's clearly not very happy about being photographed. I'm going to show you two more quick sets of pictures. I'm going to run over slightly. I apologize. Um, both from 1955, a really pivotal moment. This is, you know, the Mississippi was always, from the perspective of an, of an African American person, the Jim Crow era, a pretty dire place. But it's really after the Brown v. Board decision that that white Mississippi politics loses its mind. James Eastland, who's the, soon to be the head of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Senator from Mississippi, also the largest plantation owner in Sunflower County, Mississippi, among other political leaders, calls upon Mississippians violently to resist the court decision, that you have no obligation to obey this law. In fact, you have an obligation to oppose it. Against that backdrop, Mars attended the 1955 Neshoba County Fair. You have to be there to understand how important the Neshoba County Fair is. Mississippi's great house party. It goes back to the 1890s. Mars took great pride in the fact that among its founders, it started as a camp meeting, were her own ancestors. And by the time she comes along in the 1920s, the traditions of Fair Week are well established. White people come moving no longer into tents but into cabins built around Courthouse Square that actually cost more now than houses in Philadelphia, Mississippi, for a week of gossip and socializing. But now you can see a person beginning to see this most precious week of the year for her, something that embodied all that she cherished about tradition and family and place, but now to start to see it with new eyes. This is a luminous image to me, an image of utter innocence. 
And yet this image is almost obscene. Ross Barnett, a rumpled personal injury lawyer from nearby Leak County, whose gift for homespun racist invective, he would ride to the governorship of Mississippi. You see, all political people campaigning for office in Mississippi spoke at the Neshoba County Fair. Everyone from sheriff to Senate candidates to governor. This is where Ronald Reagan in 1980 goes to kick off the fall campaign of his first presidential election, where he invokes states' rights and tells a joke about welfare queens 16 years after and three miles from the earthen dam where the bodies of Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner were, were recovered. This is a luminous picture. We are not what we seem. As you listen to politician after politician rail in the most appalling racist ways in that pavilion, black people sit outside, one nursing a heartbreak, others sharing a private joke. A simple image of a white man drawing water for a black woman becomes in this context almost holy. Looking across from the porch of her cabin to the next cabin over one day, Mar saw something and snapped a single photo, and this is it. An image that captures all the complexity, contradiction, innocence, injustice of the racial order whose demise she was recording. She also wrote on the back of one of these prints in pencil, some things are taken to be self-evident. In effect, asking what happens if we no longer take certain things as self-evident if we trouble to see. One month later, Emmett Till was murdered. Mars and her friend, Benny Bobo, attended the trial. They were, in fact, virtually the only white women in the courtroom. They sat inside the rail next to the jury and the reporters. This was one of the most photographed trials in American history, and many of Mars's images look quite familiar. Roy Bryant, one of Till's torturers and murderers, and his wife, Carolyn, the woman who was ostensibly flirted with, with Emmett by Emmett, which led to his abduction, torture, and murder. The jury, which took one hour and six minutes to return a verdict of not guilty. One of them later quipped to the press, we wouldn't have taken so long if we hadn't stopped to get a pop. But other images that Mar saw were unlike what we have seen. A smiling Mamie Till entering the courthouse. Who knows what has just transpired, but have you ever seen Mamie Till with a smile on her face? Local black people returning to the streets of Sumner after a rain. Girls reading the local newspaper. That may be my single favorite photo. Local whites queuing up to watch the watchers who were watching them. And local black people on the other side of the courthouse clustered beneath a Confederate memorial embossed with the words, our hero, awaiting the verdict, waiting to see whether Mississippi in its descent into racial madness had come to abide the slaughter of children Little did Mars know that nine years later, she would find herself standing a similar vigil. Thank you very much. We 
have about 10 minutes for questions, so if you'll raise your hands um, if you have a question and wait for me to bring the mic to you as we are recording this class. You had a photograph, um, I believe it was 1953, and it was showed uh, white children playing on a Confederate uh, statue. Um, do you know uh, if uh, black children uh, were fearful of that statue and stayed away because of that reason, or, hmm. or were they uh, not fearful and would normally play on that, but just that wasn't what was captured? You know, it's really, it's really kind of hard to generalize. The, one of the things I often say to students when I'm teaching this is um, racial violence tends to occur less in moments of stability and more in moments when racial order is being challenged. And uh, so, you know, black and white people passed one, one another on the streets, and that one image we saw, black people were chiefly on the street rather than on the sidewalk, but they did use sidewalks. I have lots of pictures of black people walking on sidewalks. Lots of people, of occasional people, of, of black and white people even being photographed together. This is a very small town, and it's a town with virtually no in-migration. So these people know each other. This is part of what's extraordinary. They all know each other. They know who one another is. They know one another's parents and grandparents. And one of the things that white Mississippians and Philadelphians would be saying in anger to the these northern journalists coming down, representing them in all kinds of crudely stereotypical ways. So it's, we know these people. We live with these people. We love these people. And at one level, that's a kind of white racist fantasy. And at another level, it captures a reality of the terms which people had interacted. But it was also to live in Jim Crow, Mississippi, was to live in a place where if you were black, you could be taken off the board at any moment. One of the stories that I, that I, I mean, I have a lot of stories, but one guy who grew up there um, told me about how what he and his friends used to do was they would go to see the movies on Saturday night, and they would have to sit up in the balcony, of course. But then, leaving, the cops took great sport in herding them out of town. So they would make them run in front of the car while screaming kind of racial epithets at them in order to go home. It's just a form of sport. But if you wanted to see the movies, that's what you did. And he said on this one particular occasion, um, he realized he was the only one. And they, they started being more threatening. And the cops, one of whom would later be involved, I think both of whom actually would later be involved in the mob that murdered Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney, started to threaten him and to threaten to castrate him. And he ran to a house where another policeman lived who, for whom his mother was a domestic worker. And he said that he knocked on the door, the guy came to the door, he started to say, and he said loud enough for the white people in the, in the car to hear, he said, just get in the car, they'll take you home. And he did, and they did. And they drove him straight to his home because they knew exactly who he was. Please. Oops, I think you got, you're next, go ahead, that's okay. Um, first, congratulations on the book, um, which I think will recreate in a vivid graphic form a very important era in uh, Mississippi, if not Southern history. But my question is this, um, can you bring us up to date on the conditions in Philadelphia today? And if I'm not mistaken, either they have or have had a white mayor and, uh, in, of Philadelphia, and I, I assume that the uh, majority of the electorate is African-American. So could you speak about that, please? I can. Um, actually, Neshoba County, because it's not in the Black Belt, it's in the kind of red clay hills of eastern Mississippi, was always a white, substantial white majority county, still is a substantial white majority county. Uh, and Philadelphia has a black mayor. And uh, it's actually, I don't, I'm not going like 
you know, that this is a kumbaya moment. Don't misunderstand me at all. But um, it's complicated politics. For the most part, the whites in this town were completely in denial about this history for a very long time, never talked about it. The black community remembered it, erected a small memorial, and held and still held, holds every year on the anniversary of the murder a memorial service. At the 25th anniversary, for the first time, the white leadership of the town uh, convened a memorial service. And it's a remarkable moment. The Secretary of State of Mississippi at that time, a man named Dick Mulpas, who was also going to be the Democratic candidate for governor, was a child in Philadelphia, Mississippi, when this happened. Saw it like Jem in, uh, in To Kill a Mockingbird through the eyes of a 10-year-old child, and also realized that his father was not Atticus Finch. And there's lots of stories about Dick Mulpas that I can tell you, but one of the ones he said is after watching a particular episode, a conversation between Turner Catledge and his father, he said, I decided when I was 11 years old that if anybody ever asked me to stand up, I was going to stand up. So at the 25th anniversary, Dick Mulpas formally apologized in the name of his town and the state to the family members of the murdered men, notwithstanding the uh, warnings of his political advisors that this would destroy his political career, as indeed it did. At the debate the next year at the Neshoba County Fair, his Kirk Fordyce, his Republican opponent, never, never, never apologized for Mississippi, echoing the never, never, never integrate song that was sung in the early 1960s. But Dick Mulpas says, I never lost a minute of sleep over doing that. The town would again have a commemoration in, 19, in the 40th anniversary, at which time an interracial group of people would put out a call for the case to be reopened and prosecuted. And it was, and in 2005, on the 41st anniversary, the man who had orchestrated the killing, a Jack Leg Baptist minister named Preacher Edgar A. Killen, was convicted and sentenced to jail. It's still anything but a harmonious place, but it is a very different place from what it was. We had a hand up. Sorry. Um, what, one of the things you talked about was whether or not the black subjects were, maybe felt like they had to submit to the photographs. One of the things that I noticed was that the photos of white people, that, at least for the ones that we, we saw, seemed to be more spontaneous unless they were of children in which they were posed, where she did have many posed photos of, of black subjects. And so that, to me, I, I wonder if that suggests uh, some sort of submission with the children and with, with the black I actually, I've looked, that's a really good question. I've never thought of it quite that way, but I've looked and thought about this as, you know, it's a really interesting problem for a historian, right? We are most comfortable when we have textual analysis, textual material that we can sort of ask questions of. And you're trying to somehow infer something from an image, right? My impression is that whites resented being photographed more than blacks. And most of her images are f of whites are furtive. And they're candid shots. And they're often shot by people who either don't know they're being photographed. And my impression is that most of the photographs she's taking of black people is she's talking to them. They're sitting together, they're talking, and you can see the contact sheets, and you can often see a sequence of photos that are being taken. Right? And you can, in some cases, see a photo, photo that's being taken, and then other people come in so that they can get into the photo, too. I don't want to romanticize this. But the only time she ever records a person, I think I have this image, it's a great image, um, that she ever describes uh, being run off. She's taking, she sees an old black woman on a porch of a cabin. And so she pulls over as she was wont to do and uh, um, decides that she's just going to take her photo. And the white landowner comes and starts cursing her and runs her off. And it's so traumatic for her that she basically stops taking photographs for months. But what I was just going to show you about this image, I think it might even be the next one is there's the image. That's the image. Now what's interesting is if you read that image, divorced from the thing, this is like this woman saying, get the hell away from me. 
But this woman is actually watching an angry, violent confrontation between two white people below her. So that's an extraordinary picture. But again, I mean, I, I don't want to, uh, my purpose is not in some fashion to exonerate her, right? I mean, I think these ethical questions, these ethical questions don't simply exist in this context. You know, they exist in all contexts. They exist in contexts of the Syrian children's corpses becoming memes, right? And what are the ethics of actually taking photographs of the, of the world's most dispossessed and vulnerable people? And do our motives matter? Can we capture those images without in some fashion ourselves becoming complicit in that dispossession? But even if the answer to that question is no, is the alternative not to capture these images? Is the alternative to simply to turn away? So I have good news and bad news. Um, the bad news is that we are at the end of our formal class. The good news is, is that Professor Campbell has graciously agreed to stay afterwards and answer individual questions. The better news is that there's also plenty of wine out there while we talk. <laughs> Thank you very much.